Welcome to Dr. Will's History Road Trip. I'm your host, Dr. Will, and tonight I want to talk about the presidential election of 1876, which is one of the most interesting, one of the most controversial, probably one of the most corrupt elections in U.S. history. Um, definitely one of the most important. It's one of only five elections in U.S. history in which the candidate who won at least a plurality of the vote meaning they got more than everybody else, but not necessarily a majority, which is 50%, did not win the electoral vote. So the five elections where a candidate won the plurality popular vote didn't win the electoral vote. That happened in 1824, 1988, excuse me, 1888, 2000, 2016, and then this one we're talking about, 1876. This is the only election in U.S. history in which a candidate who won a clear majority of the popular vote didn't win the electoral vote. It's the closest elected election in U.S. history by electoral vote. This is decided by one electoral vote, which may, it's even closer than the 2000 election, which I think the margin was five electoral votes. And perhaps most importantly, this election marked the end of the period in U.S. history known as Reconstruction. So let's go back a little bit and talk about Reconstruction to give you some background on what's going on in 1876. During Reconstruction, Congress had taken over the, the, the actual functioning of Reconstruction from the president, who at the time was Andrew Johnson. He had been Abraham Lincoln's vice president. And in 1867, they passed a law called the Military Reconstruction Act, which put the South under military rule. In order to re-enter the Union, the former Confederate states first had to ratify the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment, in my mind, is probably the most important of our constitutional amendments outside the Bill of Rights. Um, it did a lot of things. Um, there's still a lot of arguing about, about what it says or doesn't say about birthright citizenship, but the important part for our purposes in this discussion is that it granted citizenship to freedmen. The, the 14th Amendment basically said that freed slaves were citizens of the state they lived in and citizens of the nation, and they could not be denied equal protection under the law by states. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one thing, you had to have a constitutional amendment to do this because you had a previous Supreme Court decision just about 10 years earlier that said black people in general, slave or free, it didn't matter, weren't citizens of the United States. And of course, that was the infamous Dred Scott decision. So this basically turns Dred Scott on its head. And it also gets rid of some state laws that were being passed by the former Confederate states called black codes. And black codes were laws that basically were designed to um, restrict the freedom of black citizens as much as possible. Slavery is over, it's done with. They recognize that. And when you had slavery, the slave master is the one that restricts the freedom of, of the black population of the South. Now that you don't have slavery, the state decides they're going to do it. What the 14th Amendment basically said was states can't do that. They have You can't have separate laws that apply to these people and other laws that apply to these people. The laws have to apply equally. So in order to get back into the Union, states had to ratify the 14th Amendment. When that was first proposed in 1866, the only former Confederate state that did that was Tennessee. So Tennessee will escape most of the bitterness of, of Reconstruction that went on in a lot of the Deep South and, and in other places. But they, they had to ratify the 14th Amendment. By 1868, that had been ratified. And all but three or four ex-Confederate states had done so. The last three or four to ratify the, the ones who had not ratified it yet, the ones that were remaining, Congress also required to ratify the 15th Amendment, which was proposed in 1868 and then actually ratified by Congress or ratified by the states in 1870. The 15th Amendment essentially protected black voting rights. It said that you could not be denied the right to vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Okay, Now, Going back to the 14th Amendment, another thing the 14th Amendment had done was it disenfranchised many ex-Confederates. Part of the 14th Amendment read that if you um, had ever taken an, an oath to uphold the Constitution and then you rebelled against the U.S. government, 
you couldn't vote or hold office again. Well, that means if you had been an army officer before the Civil War, and then you joined the Confederate Army, that disbarred you from voting. If you'd been a government official, like a, a congressman, a senator, even, even state officials, you had taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. If you then supported the Confederacy, then you were disbarred. So what that did was it, it kept high-ranking Confederates from voting and participating in government. So you add that to the fact that now by 1868, the time the 14th Amendment is ratified, now blacks can vote as well, or, or at least adult black males can vote. And you've got a lot of ex-Confederates that would not have been prohibited from voting under the terms of the 14th Amendment because they hadn't taken that oath to uphold the Constitution before the war. But a lot of them were just so disgusted at the fact that, that blacks were voting that they just refused to participate. The result is that, starting in around 1868, 1870, Republicans started to win elections all over the South. Okay? In a lot of states, that what this meant was you had a lot more black voters than you had white voters. And they're going to vote Republican because that was the party of, of Abraham Lincoln. That was the party of emancipation. Uh, Republicans took control of every ex-Confederate state except for Virginia between 1869 and 1876. Now, there was resistance. Organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, Knights of the White Camellia, uh, organizations like that sprung up all over the South to try and prevent Southern Republicans from voting. And when I say Southern Republicans, that's white Republicans too. There were Not only did you have black Southerners supporting the Republican Party, but um, whites from the North who had moved to the South, commonly referred to as carpetbaggers, many of them, most of them, I would argue, were voted Republican. The same would be true of scalawags. That would be native Southerners, native white Southerners that also participated uh, with the Republican Party. So groups like the KKK, Knights of the White Camellia, um, th there's a cabillion of them, but they're all out there trying to do the same thing, and that's prevent Southern Republicans from voting. And most of those Republicans are trying to prevent from voting are black because that's the majority of, of Republican voters in the South were black. Now, federal government tried to address this. They, they passed laws like the Force Act in 1870, which made it a federal crime to interfere with a person trying to cast their ballot. They passed the KKK Act in 1871, which uh, gave the President of the United States the power to declare martial law in, in the areas of states with heavy Klan activity. And that act was invoked on a number of occasions. I know at one point in 1872, when Ulysses S. Grant was president, he declared martial law, I think, in eight or nine counties in North Carolina. So it, it gets invoked. But despite that, by the time you get to the mid-1870s, interest in Reconstruction was starting to wane in the North. By 1873, 74, people in the North just weren't as interested in it as they were before. Part of the reason is it had been going on about 10 years. We'd been talking about Reconstruction even before the Civil War was over. As early as 1863, Abraham Lincoln had announced his plan for Reconstruction. And, you know, Americans weren't that different in the 1860s than they are today in that we've got short attention spans. We'll be all about something for a little while, and if it drags on too long, it's like, eh, and then we're done with it, okay? And that started to happen in the North, okay? Another issue that caused Reconstruction to become less of a, a I guess, high-attention item was the corruption of the Grant administration. Ulysses S. Grant's administration was notoriously corrupt. I don't think Grant himself was corrupt, but he didn't... Uh, he turned a blind eye, I think, to a lot of the things that happened in his administration. And there was a lot of corruption going on. The, the National Republican Party had become very corrupt. There was corruption in the Democratic Party, too. But there's a lot of corruption, and, and that starts to become more of an issue. In 1874, just to show you how Reconstruction was becoming less of an issue, Democrats won control of the House of Representatives for the first time since 1862. So here we are, less than 10 years removed from the end of the Civil War, and Democrats are winning back control of the House of Representatives, which shows you people are start, in the North are starting to care less about Reconstruction. Now, this sets the stage for the presidential election of 1876. It's one of the most important in U.S. history. The front runner for the Republican nomination going into the convention that year 
was a senator from Maine named James G. Blaine. However, many Republicans feared he couldn't win a general election because he was notorious for being corrupt. And this election, even early on, was shaping up to be a referendum on corruption in the federal government. Eventually, the GOP nomination went to a relative outsider, Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio. Hayes had served with distinction as Colonel of the 23rd Ohio during the Civil War. After the war, he was elected to be a U.S. representative from Ohio and then the governor of Ohio. His main asset as a presidential candidate is that he was squeaky clean. Um, as the GOP tried to shed their reputation for corruption in the 1870s, they couldn't have picked a better candidate. There was not a hint of corruption on Rutherford B. Hayes. As a matter of fact, his wife, whose name was Lucy Hayes, was given the nickname Lemonade Lucy because at official state functions, she refused to serve alcohol. She served lemonade, which made a lot of uh, politicians and, and press people pretty angry. But that's what they gave her that derogatory nickname, Lu Lemonade Lucy. So Hayes is squeaky clean, okay? This is not a guy you can tag with corruption. The Democrats are also gonna go with a candidate with a reputation for honesty, Samuel J. J. Tilden, the former governor of New York. Tilden had been involved in New York politics since the 1840s. I mean, he was, he was old at this point. He was in his early 60s. And uh, he he'd gotten involved way back in, in Democratic politics in the 1840s where he became a protege of former President Martin Van Buren. In 1868, he became the chair of the New York Democratic Committee, and he played a large role in taking down the corrupt New York City Tammany Hall political machine. Now, that was a Democratic political machine in New York City, led by a man named William Tweed, often known as Boss Tweed. And Tilden helped take this, this corrupt political machine down, a machine of politicians belonging to his own party. So he's got a reputation for fighting corruption too and not being afraid to call it out in his own, in his own party. And after, after that successful tenure as chair of the Democratic Committee in New York, he's elected governor of that state in 1874. So you've got two governors from two northern states, both of them have um, very good reputations. One of them's a war hero. Um, the other one is, is not a war hero, but he's been in politics for a long time. Now, this campaign involved the usual attacks that you saw on political campaigns after the Civil War. Democrats highlighted the corruption under the Grant administration. The Republicans blamed the Democrats for the Civil War, a tactic known as waving the bloody shirt. Um, the reason they did that is because when the South seceded in 1861, the Democratic Party was pretty much the only political party in the South. The Whig Party had died out in the early 1850s. There was not a Republican Party in the South before the Civil War because it was a an anti-slavery, um, pro-federal government, helping out industry type of party, and th that those things just weren't going to play in the South. A common Republican slogan at the time was this, not every Democrat was a rebel, but every rebel was a Democrat. And that, that's how they, they attacked the Democrats after the Civil War. Voter intimidation and fraud was rampant in the South during this election cycle, particularly in states with a large black population. Uh, a lot of that was because the Democrats tried to use violence and intimidation to keep black voters from the polls. Um, black Republicans anyway, which is going to be most of them. The result of this is going to be one of the most jacked up elections in U.S. history. Um, now, I understand as, as I'm speaking these words, we, we're going through a pretty jacked up one right now. So just I'm excluding 2020 because everything about 2020 politics or not has been jacked up. But this race basically comes down to three disputed electoral votes in th or disputed votes in three states, Florida, Arkansas, and South Carolina. Now, unsurprisingly, those were the last three former Confederate states still run by Republicans. Voter fraud and corruption in those states was bipartisan. Both parties were cheating. In South Carolina, 101% of eligible voters cast votes. That's not possible, right? That means there's some shenanigans going on. Now, the Democrats appeared to have more votes in those states. And they probably did because they had probably intimidated enough Republicans from not going to the polls, and they probably stuffed enough ballot boxes to get those extra votes. But Republican governors and election boards in those states, 
decided that those votes were fraudulent, and these uh, and they went ahead and just said, no, nope, we're going to certify this election for Republicans, and they elected appointed Republican electors, the state legislators did. Democrats in those states said, no, you can't do that. We've won, and they appointed electors too. The result is that when the electoral votes were sent to Washington, D.C., to be opened and counted in the new session of Congress in January of 1877, all three states sent two sets of electoral votes. So you get to D.C., they're supposed to open these votes in front of a joint session of Congress. Arkansas sent two sets, one Republican, one Democrat. Florida sent two sets. Hell, South Carolina sent three. I don't know how that happened, but there were three disputed sets of votes from South Carolina. Now, there was one disputed electoral vote coming out of Oregon, too, which clearly should have gone to Rutherford B. Hayes. Oregon had a Democratic governor, and he tried to dispute it on a technicality. It eventually went to Hayes because everybody knew that Hayes had won that vote. So here's the problem. Congress has met in their first session. Who won the election? You don't know. It's close. And it all comes down to these three states, and they've sent two sets of, of electors or two sets of electoral votes to Washington, South Carolina had sent three. Well, this is a conundrum. So what does the Constitution say about it? Well, it doesn't. <laughs> There's no nothing in the Constitution that deals with how, how, what, how do you choose between two disputed sets of electoral votes. This is an unprecedented situation. I mean, truly a constitutional crisis. Now, what the Constitution does state is that the president pro tem of the Senate and uh, should open the votes and count them. Now, the question is, okay, which vote should he count? Well, the Republicans said, let him count whichever votes he wants. Why? Well, the president pro tem of the Senate at the time was a Republican. So, of course, they would say that. The Democrats argued, said, no, 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 this isn't what we're going to do. Obviously, we, we can't trust this process, which means nobody got a majority of electoral votes. And according to the 12th Amendment, if nobody gets a majority of electoral votes, the House of Representatives decided. And of course they would say that because that's the one body that the Democrats controlled. Okay, So what do you do? Neither side looks like they're willing to budge. Well, to solve this problem, Congress is going to pass a law called the Electoral Commission Act of 1877. By the way, Congress loves to do this. They, they don't really like making controversial decisions, so a lot of time they'll pass things off to a blue-ribbon panel. Um, I remember when I was in college and they started shutting down uh, military bases all over the country. Neither party in Congress wanted to do that and then tell their constituents why they voted to shut down a military base that brought money to their community, so they assigned it to a blue ribbon panel. Well, this is a little bit more than a blue ribbon panel. This law was called the Electoral Commission Act. It's passed by Congress on January 29th of 1877, and this called for a 15-man commission to study the election results and to come up with a solution. Now, once this commission came up with a solution, they would make their recommendation to Congress. Now, again, this is a recommendation. Congress didn't have to take their recommendation, but the implication here is that they probably would. Here's who made up this electoral commission. So, again, 15 people. This commission is going to comprise five members of the House of Representatives, five senators, and five Supreme Court justices. There's 15, okay? So the House of Representatives got around to choosing their members for this commission. Remember, the House is controlled by Democrats, so you'd think they'd pick five Democrats, right? Well, no, they decided to be gentlemanly. They picked three Democrats and two Republicans. The Senate got to pick their members, and they said, well, that was pretty nice of the House. So they did the same thing. The Senate picked three Republicans and two Democrats. So now you've got five and five, five of each party. This is where it gets interesting. <laughs> of the Supreme Court justice, the law itself, the Electoral Commission Act itself, named four of the justices. The act itself picked two justices that were known to be Republicans and two that were known to be Democrats. And, and then it said those four will decide on the fifth member themselves. So at this point, you've got seven and seven, seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and now the four Supreme Court justices on the commission have to pick the fifth man. Well, it was widely believed that the fifth person they would pick was a justice named David Davis of Illinois. Because David Davis was, he, he had 
befriended members of both parties. He, he had voted for um, both parties at different points in his life. He, he was a friend and political ally of Abraham Lincoln, but he'd also supported Democrats for public office. He's about as independent as you could get. And here's where the Democrats made a big time error. It was well known, especially in Illinois where he was from, that David Davis had always wanted to be a senator. And it just so happened that there was a vacant U.S. Senate seat from Illinois at that time. Now, this is back before the 17th Amendment. Up until 1913, you didn't go to the polls and elect your senators. Um, state legislature, under the way the Constitution originally operated, state legislatures voted for their senators. Well, the Democrats controlled the Illinois legislature. So they, they came up with an idea. They said, you know what? If we elect David Davis to the Senate, I bet he'll be so happy that he'll pick our guy Tilden, and that would give him an 8-7 to seven advantage on the commission. So they did that. They elected David Davis to be senator from Illinois, and it backfired. Davis was so excited to begin his duties as a senator that he immediately resigned from the Supreme Court. So now what do you do? Now the justices have to pick somebody else, and everybody left on the court was a Republican. Well, they picked a man named Joseph Bradley. He was the one they thought was the most impartial, but he's definitely a Republican. And when the Electoral Commission studied the election, they got around to voting, they voted exactly the way you'd think they would. They went eight to seven for Hayes along straight party lines. Eight Republicans, seven Democrats. That's how they voted. Now, at this point, without the disputed states, Sam Tilden had 184 electoral votes, and Hayes had 165. You needed 185 electoral votes to win in 1876, which meant Hayes had to get all 20 disputed votes. Tilden only needed one. So the Electoral Commission makes their recommendation to Congress, but remember, it's just a recommendation. Their decision wasn't legally binding. Now, it was generally accepted, like I said, that Congress would accept their recommendation, but the House of Representatives could have held this thing up forever. Well, it's under these circumstances that Southern Democrats in Congress struck up a deal with congressional Republicans, and this deal came to be known as the Compromise of 1877. Under the terms of this compromise, the Democrats would agree to let Hayes be awarded the remaining 20 electoral votes. In other words, the Democrats are saying, we'll step aside and we'll let Hayes be the president in return for three things. Number one, Hayes has to withdraw the last remaining federal troops from the South. In other words, those three states where there's, there's still Union occupying forces, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. I said Arkansas earlier, didn't I? I meant Louisiana. Then uh, Hayes will withdraw the last remaining federal troops from those states. Second stipulation is that Hayes would appoint a Southerner to his cabinet. And that man would be responsible for handing out federal jobs. In other words, the South, they, they want to get in on some of this, um, uh, some of the political goodie bag as well. Number three, the South will get federal money to rebuild following Reconstruction. So those three things the South wants in return for allowing, hey, for, for the Democrats stepping back and allowing Hayes to be inaugurated, they want A, the last federal troops taken out of the, the South. B, they want a Southerner appointed to Hayes' cabinet who will be responsible for handing out federal jobs. And C, they, the South wants federal money to help rebuild following Reconstruction. Now get this. These terms were agreed to on March the 2nd, 1877. Back in those days, Inauguration Day was on March the 4th. It didn't change until 1937. So think about this. Two days before inauguration, we still know who the president was, and then they struck this deal. Okay? So this election is important for a number of reasons. First of all, the biggest reason this is important is it ended Reconstruction. Reconstruction is over at this point. Now, from the point of view of Southern blacks, this was disastrous. Once federal troops were withdrawn from the South, there was no one to protect their voting rights. It would take 20 years for them to be disfranchised completely. That's not going to start happening until the 1890s or so. But this opens the door, okay? A second importance of this election, at least politically, is that this cemented the South as solidly Democratic. Once it lost power in the South, the Republican Party remained out of power there for over 100 years. 
no Republican candidate would carry electoral votes in a former Confederate state until Warren G. Harding did, and he carried Tennessee in 1920. Okay? No former Confederate state that experienced a long period of occupation by federal troops. Remember, Tennessee wasn't occupied very long. But no Confederate state that experienced a lot of occupation voted Republican until 1928, when Herbert Hoover carried Texas, Florida, North, North Carolina, and Virginia. South Carolina didn't give any electoral votes to a Republican candidate until 1964, when the state went for Barry Goldwater, a hundred years after the Civil War. So this election proved to be very monumental politically um, and socially for a number of reasons, and we'll, we'll talk some more in a future video about the Jim Crow era and about the election of 1896, which I believe hastened the Jim Crow era. But this election is definitely one of the important ones that you need to know. There are a few in American history that I think every American should know about. This is without a doubt one of those. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Dr. Will's History Road Trip. Everybody have a great one. See you on the road. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Dr. Will's History Road Trip. If you like what I'm doing and want to continue following, please subscribe to my channel and click the notification button so you'll get updates when I post new content. Also, please consider supporting me via PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. Your support will enable me to go to interesting places and film them and talk about them with you. Feel free to suggest locations that you might like to see me visit in the comments below. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on the road.